before we actually start with the quantum mechanical model for the electron, let's first summarize all the experiments that we discussed that preceded this model. So you want to remember that the first experiment was actually the black body radiation experiment. When you heat an object, it tends to start to glow at a certain temperature, and that glow corresponds to a particular wavelength or particular frequency. To explain this particular uh, observation, Max Planck, has to assume that the light energy that's being emitted by the hot object has to come in in the form of specific values or specific packets. The value of each packet of energy has to correspond to this number, which is h times the frequency of light that's being emitted. And n is just a whole number. So it can come in 1 times this value. Energy cannot be emitted if it's one and a half times this value, for example, or 1.3 times this value. And this idea that the light can only come in multiples of h nu is what we refer to now as the quantization of light energy, okay, or the discreteness of light energy. Second experiment was the photoelectric experiment, right? This was the idea that when light uh, is shine on a surface of a metal, and the metal of course contains electrons in the atoms. The electrons might be emitted if the light has a certain frequency, um, and the kinetic energy of the electron will depend then on the frequency of the light that hits it. In order to be able to explain this observation, you can't assume that light comes in as a wave in this case. Einstein did, which is to assume that light in this case comes as a finite number of energy quanta. In other words, it comes as a stream of specific particles, each particle having a particular energy, and that energy is given by this value h nu. This light particles is what we call a photon now, and this is of course Einstein's equation for the photoelectric effect that explained that the kinetic energy of the electron that's emitted will depend on the energy of the photon of light that strikes the surface of the metal minus something called the binding energy or the work function, which is basically the amount of energy that holds the electron in place in the atom. At about the same time of these discoveries uh, associated with Einstein and Planck, there was work done on the atomic emission spectra. And what it is is basically the observation that there's a difference in the light spectrum that you observe for pure elements like helium or barium or hydrogen versus something that we would see for a white light. When we split the white light we would see a continuous spectrum like this where all the colors are represented and they just blend into each other. If you were to look at pure elements what you will see is a specific line corresponding to one specific wavelength of light. So the uh, person who came up with an equation to predict the wavelength that would show up for the hydrogen atom is Rydberg, and his equation is shown right here. However, he could not explain why the equation has to have this form. So he had a constant with this value where n1 and n2 has to be positive whole numbers, but again, he can't explain the significance of this constant or the significance of the positive whole numbers. It's not until Niels Bohr came along that a model, a theoretical model for this equation uh, uh, came up. The electrons in the hydrogen atom must be located or must be restricted at specific locations around the nucleus. This is what he calls the orbits, or the energy levels. Because the electron can only occupy this specific energy level, as a result, all of this location is not allowed by the Bohr model. That's why you only see specific lines in the emission spectra. If all of these locations are allowed, then of course you will see all kinds of colors. Now of course this is what gives rise to the different colors as we just talked about. So if you have a transmission uh, electron falling from a specific orbit, let's say orbit n equals 3 to n equals 1 or n equals 2 for example, you're going to have different uh, types of wavelengths being emitted. This model it clearly uh, worked very well to explain the behavior of the hydrogen atom as well as other one electron systems. However, it turns out that the Bohr model failed when we have to start to work with multi electron systems, which is basically the rest of the periodic table. In order to be able to work with these atoms, we have to discuss a couple of other experiments, which then gives us a better idea of what the electron is actually like. It was a hypothesis that de Broglie proposed. He was saying that if Einstein can say that light has a dual nature, in other words, light sometimes behaves like particles, which is indicated here, 
or it sometimes behaves like a wave, then de Broglie says that maybe matter or particle can also have wave-like properties and you can give a wavelength to a particular particle and that wavelength will be given by this equation h over mv where h is Planck's constant, m is the mass of the particle and v is the velocity of the particle. Okay, and turns out that when what he proposed could be supported experimentally, the experiment of electron diffraction uh, by a nickel crystal, which uh, was done by Davison and Germer. And remember that diffraction is a property of wave. Okay, so the fact that electrons, which was originally thought as a particle, can be diffracted implies that electron must have a wave-like property. Now, the next experiment called the double slit experiment. If you have uh, a particle like the electron, right? And again, electron is classically considered a particle. If you think of electron as a particle and if you shoot a bunch of electron through a double slit looking something like this, what you will see on the film is you would see just two light patterns right here, which corresponds to the electron as it hits the film. However, when you use an electron source to shoot through the double slit, what you see is not something like this, but what you see is actually something like this, which is what we uh, know of as an interference pattern. So something that people have known for a long time if you were to shoot light. So in other words, here we see that electron behaves exactly like a wave. How exactly does the electron do this? How do we get this kind of pattern when we expect something like this? So then the question that people wanted to know is, what exactly does the electron do when it crosses this double slit? You need some kind of um, uh, instrument to measure what the electron does when it crosses the, the double slit. As it turns out, when you use light to observe the path of the electron right as it comes out from the slit, it turns out that what you get as a pattern on this side is exactly what you would expect for a particle. This is then what led to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. What he's saying is the following. You can't really look at the electron because the act of observing the electron changes the properties of the electron. This effect depends a lot on the size of the particle, but this is Heisenberg's equation. He's saying that the error associated with the position of the electron and the error associated with its momentum is never smaller than this quantity h over 4 pi where h is Planck's constant. As remember we discussed in these two uh, ex uh, examples, right? So remember we tried to calculate the de Broglie wavelength for uh, the two objects shown here, baseball and electron, and we notice that for a baseball, the number is so small that it's not a measurable number, so as a result, we can pretty much consider a baseball a particle. However, for an electron, that number is sizable. To that extent, we need to consider the, B, the wave property of the electron to be more significant than the baseball. Second example we did was to uh, the error associated with position for two objects, again a marble and an electron in this case, and we found that the uncertainty with respect to the marble is very, very small. You can imagine that you can have a marble right here. This is the position of your marble. However, basically the uncertainty is so small that you can pretty much know for sure that your marble is located right there. Okay. However, when you're talking about the electron, if this is the electron, the uncertainty is so huge that you can have an uncertainty that spans the screen and even more. So you can't tell where exactly the electron is because it could be anywhere between here, whereas with the object the size of a marble, you are pretty sure that the object is located right at that particular position. So that's really the concepts that came up before quantum mechanics was developed. But basically, the N idea that we need to uh, understand at this point is the fact that you can't describe the property of the electron using particle equation from classical mechanics which relies on Newton's laws. Okay, The reason for this is because it turns out that the electron shows wave-like properties and because of the size of the electron the wave-like properties are actually significant. In order to be able to explain the property of the electron you have to use wave-like equations. However, because electron is, uh, the electron is a very special type of wave particle that is bound to the nucleus, right? The electron doesn't just fly off the nucleus or else we would not have any atom. So if you want to use wave equations to explain the behavior of the electron, you have to choose a special type of wave and that's what we're going to start to talk about in the next video.